the founder story is important because it gives the brand more like soul and a history. But when you are the brand, it actually increases the risk, I think, for the actual like products and the brand that you are marketing. You do need to advocate for your brand and really tell the story and share the story, but you're not going to be the face of the brand forever and the economics probably change. We've seen some cases where the founder does become the brand, which I think increases the risk. And when I see brands so intertwined with one person, I just question the longevity of that brand because what happens if that person goes away for some reason? Does the business suffer? I don't know. I just prefer to share the story and tell the story, but like, I don't want to be the brand. Hello and welcome to D2C Podcast. I'm Eric Dick. Today we're questing with Hero Cosmetics founder and CEO Ju Ryu, who recently sold her business for $600 and $30 million after bootstrapping it from zero after just five years. A wise singer once said, I need a hero, and I think they were talking about you. In light of mounting retail and D2C ecosystem challenges combined with the worst economy modern marketers have ever seen, Jew's exit represents a massive win for the health and beauty space, as well as for all entrepreneurs out there with a dream. This podcast goes deep on reversing the D2C playbook with Amazon first, retail second, and D2C last, building for saleability from day one. You'll hear why Jew doesn't want to be considered a girl boss and how her life has changed since seeing all those zeros hit her bank account. Are you holding out for a hero who is both fresh from the fight, larger than life? Listen no further. Jew Ryu will be here till the morning light. On with the show. Are you ready to grow your audience and revenue? Send in Blue is a multi-channel marketing platform that empowers businesses to create stronger customer relationships. Create personalized emails, captivating SMS campaigns, chat, custom landing pages, quick sign-up forms, automated workflows, and more instantly. Curious to learn more? Sign up today at sendinblue.com forward slash DTC and enter promo code DTC to get one month free on a premium plan. Do it all with Send in Blue. Ju, welcome to the D2C podcast. I'm so glad to have you here. Uh, you co-founded Hero Cosmetics in 2017, um, but didn't follow uh, what was considered at that time to be the D2C playbook. Can you start us off talking a little bit about your choices to start the business and how, how you sort of differed from what was sort of happening in the space, in the D2C space? Yes. Well, first, thanks for having me. I know we were connecting, trying to connect for a while, so it's glad to finally sit down and chat. So we started in 2017, and back then that was, you know, it was like the era of Away and Glacier and Allbirds and a lot of those big DVC brands. Um, and really the playbook was to raise a bunch of money, um, create your own DVC website off of Shopify or what have you. Um, and really that was the business model is that, you know, you're going to go, yeah, I mean, direct to consumer via your own website. But what we did was we decided to bootstrap. So it was really important to me that the business that we build, um, be, you know, I didn't want it to be a, a black hole basically, or a money pit basically. And so, um, uh, I really wanted it to be a bootstrap profitable business from the very beginning. And we started selling on Amazon. Um, so we had one SKU, we sold on Amazon and there are a lot of reasons for that. One was I already knew that people were looking for this product on that channel. Um, I, you know, I think just getting up to, um, the go to market strategy, I think from Amazon was really, uh, fast. Uh, it was also, it was fast, it was cheap and it was pretty simple. Like it didn't require a lot of money or a lot of people. And, um, and, you know, I, I mean, again, like where else are you going to have access to hundreds and million of millions of potential consumers um, because Amazon already had that marketplace built out. And so for all those reasons, we decided to start on Amazon. What was the, uh, this is probably just simple searching, but what, what was the data you had to know that the market demand was there on Amazon? Was it just other products? There, there, so there were some other Similar products that, um, I mean, 
uh, like there, there were a few that were getting um, getting somewhat known. But we also we used tools like Jungle Scout. We had used, um, and you can use those tools. Like they have cool plugins where um, you you know you add the plugin into your Google browser, and then you go onto Amazon and like go onto any product page, and it'll show you. Uh, the data for that SKU, so approximate searches, approximate um, kind of revenue. Um, and so all that was really helpful in terms of getting a lay of the land, um, in terms of knowing like what the competition out there was already doing. And I knew we could do it a thousand times better. Um, and so, yeah, there was a little bit of data that we uh, armed ourselves with. And then when it comes to your category, you said there were maybe a few products you've you, you know, you knew you could evolve the, the category, but there's, it's also an aspect of, it's a, is there an aspect of category creation with your product as well? Yes. Or, or it's how yeah. you've defined your category has led to it being viewed as its own sort of category creator. Yeah. Yeah. I mean this, it, we are a category creator because, um, I mean the acne patch didn't really exist in the U S really until we created it. Uh, there were a few products that were foreign products by foreign brands. A lot of them were Korean brands uh, that sold in the U.S. So, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of them did sell on Amazon. But they were never good at doing the education or the marketing to really, um, uh, yeah, to do the marketing and education for the product category. And that's what we did, and that's what we continue to do. And I mean, we're like 80% of the category. We're the number one acne patch brand. Um, and I think a lot of brands saw our success. And now, I mean, the category is getting really competitive, and we see a lot of like Me Too products. Uh, there are a lot of big brands out there that now have their own acne patch uh, product. But I think what we've done is, yeah, essentially created a new category of acne treatment because what people were using it before. It was the white creams or the pink creams. Uh, and we're, what we've done is we've really shown that this hydrochloric acne patch is actually a much better alternative because it's less irritating, it doesn't leave your skin red, and it's really effective at getting the gunk out. Um, and so, yeah, there was a lot of marketing and education that, um, that we did. So you you launched on Amazon, and I probably you saw some pretty immediate returns. You saw some like okay, yes. the market is here. The product, the people responded well. What what about your Amazon launch? Did you guys just absolutely nail? And what would you have done differently, maybe, when you launched now? I mean, we only had one channel, so I think that helped because I think there are a lot of brands where um, they launch Amazon later. And so they have a hard time sacrificing, for example, D2C for Amazon. Um, but because it was our only channel for a while, like a good 12 months, it was our only channel. Um, we put all our marketing efforts towards winning on Amazon. So, um, you know, if we had influencers that were talking about our product, we had them linked to Amazon. We had like a splash page. Um, I mean, we had, you know, kind of a website. It was essentially a splash page. Uh, and the CTA went to Amazon. We started building up an email list. Everything went to Amazon. Like literally everything went to Amazon. Press went to Amazon. And, and Press, they really love linking to Amazon because the conversions are really strong and they get really good affiliate revenue. So all that, I think, um, really helped us win. Uh, you know, we did all like the things that you're supposed to do, like optimize your images and optimize your SEO and your keywords and the sponsored ad um, product strategy and, and all that stuff. Um, and, but I think really, yeah, the key thing was probably it was our only channel. And so we optimized the hell out of it and just really focused on it to win. It's a really interesting point that I hadn't heard of that PR is, is it's, it eases the path of conversion and makes PR maybe obviously you had a good story as well and great branding. And I, I just love the idea of a patch too, is just such a, in terms of solutions, in terms of people's mindsets for solutions, like a patch just makes so much more sense than a cream you rub on in a way, right? You feel like it's going to get the job done better in a way. Right, right. And it probably does. Mm -hmm. Um, very cool. And so, so Amazon was a big success, had a lot of pickup from that. What were, what, like once you were scaling on Amazon, essentially, what was, what was your sort of next move with the brand? So immediately we went into retail. So this is, yeah, this is why I always say that, you know, we're a kind of digitally native brand, but we did DTC all backwards because 
we went Amazon and then we went into retail and then we launched our official D2C website like July of 2018. So we launched on Amazon. I immediately started pitching retailers. The first one that said yes to us with, was Anthropology. We launched um, January of 18, 2018 with an 80 store test. And then within a week, the performance was really strong. So she launched this nationally. And, and the press, the, the continued press that we were getting um, resulted in a lot of inbound requests from retailers too. So I remember we had an article in Into the Gloss, which was the, the content arm of Glossier at the time. I, I don't know what's going on with that site, but um, we had an article and immediately I, I started getting inbound emails from all sorts of retailers asking for our samples. Um, so retail, specialty retail was a big strategy in 2018, like Goop, Neiman Marcus, uh, anthropology, Urban Outfitters, a lot of these retailers to give us uh, sc basically street cred um, and validity out there. And then we launched D2C. So again, a little bit of a flavor of how we did things kind of totally black backwards, but it still ended up working for us. Very interesting. I know, um, so with the agency that we're partnered with at D2C Pilot House, they work actually with Unilever. And Unilever uh, came and spoke at our last event in um in Victoria, and they had uh, they laid out their like whole strategy for how they launch exclusively on Amazon. Actually, they're they're kind of maybe they're taking a little of the Jurayu playbook, um, <laughs> but they're but they launch exclusively on Amazon because it's it, as you mentioned, it's got all the customers there. It's this kind of closed system that really allows you to focus on dialing in what works um, without having to spend a lot, without having to you know with, without having to put ads into the social feed and and, and things like that. So yeah, um, I, I, I like that you're writing yeah. a new playbook. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you moved to D to C, what were did you have? Because it feels it feels like you know because you nailed the product and the brand so well. Your brand story is great. You had a lot of success on Amazon. It, feel, it sounds like you know your first major your first retail is Anthropology. Like you you sound like you had a really great hit with uh, with retail as well. Then when you moved to D to C, what were your what like what was your launch process when you actually went to to, to do D to C marketing? We launched um, kind of around a holiday, which is Acne Awareness Month, um, and that is June. So I found out that June uh, is this thing called Acne Awareness Month. And what we decided to do was give out free samples on our website. Um, and it, we got so much press around this. I, it actually was really brilliant. So um, we created our Shopify site. Um, we actually didn't have, I can't remember if it was shoppable or not, but um, but the idea was we were just going to give out free samples. We had all these samples made. We were going to give out free samples because we knew that when people tried our product, they really, really loved it. So we tied ourselves to this kind of holiday or, yeah, I mean, I, not, it's not really a holiday, but it's a, it's a month with a theme. And um, so the message was really around, you know, in honor of Acne Awareness Month, you know, we want to help normalize acne. And so we're giving out free samples of our Mighty Patch products throughout this month. And we got so much press. I remember like, uh, like the press just devoured um, this, this promotion. And so we got picked up everywhere and we got a ton of traffic and, and redemptions of um, the free samples. Um, and it went on, I think, for that entire month. So it was, it's, it was really great to sort of get our name out there, to start building up our email list, to get samples in the hands of people. Uh, and then we officially la launched, I believe, um, like our shoppable site in July. So that was a little bit about how we um, about how we did that. And I think it went yeah really well, actually. Very cool. And then it's funny, I, I just was, you know, one of the other guys that spoke at this, uh, this, our last event was Sean Frank from Ridge Wallet. And I just saw that oh, he I recently did Sean. something. Sean's he's just so a, funny. A, a, he's Twitter. so funny. He's like... such a force of nature. He's such a <laughs> yeah. troll at the same time as being so smart, uh, which I really enjoy. Yeah. Um, but his his recent announcement about Mr. Beast about that that they that they donated a hundred thousand dollars of product to Mr. Beast of duffel bags to be given to sort of homeless people part of his his sort of charity efforts there and it's 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 so smart it's it's a, it's great for the world it's also so smart as a marketer because he's giving a hundred thousand dollars of of perceived value but it's actually probably fifteen thousand or twenty thousand dollars of product. Um, so it has that added benefit as well. So it's cool to hear the giveaway when you, when you, when you have such confidence in your product as, as you guys do with yours, I guess that, that really just helps seed the user base and, and the demand out there. And it's so smart that the press picks it up as well. Oh yeah. Um, 
I have to say, um, cool. earned media for us was always a huge strategy. Like I, in the early days, when an article went out and linked to our page on Amazon, I saw the bump um, in sales. And so, you know, quickly, like we really doubled down on press because for us, it was a big, um, a big way to start uh, selling pretty quickly. Amazing. So you're laying the groundwork for D2C with all this great stuff. And then wh when, it, when the rubber meets the road, was it meta? Was it just meta that you guys launched on first? And how did that go? In terms of um, uh, continuing, on, like continue, continuing to ac acquire uh, new consumers, yeah, I mean, we we tried to find an agency. We didn't really have anybody that really knew how to run the ads, and so we worked with a few agencies that didn't work out. But to be fair, I don't think our business was set up um, to be to acquire consumers or users uh, profitably because. We only had like two or three SKUs. Our AOV was really low. Our AOV at the time was like fifteen dollars, um, and so you can imagine with like CAC and stuff, it just you know it was really hard to make the economics work. And so, uh, but we still kept trying. We eventually brought that role in house, so we could have someone dedicated to it um, one hundred percent of the time, and also do other things. Um, but eventually, you know, as we started launching more SKUs, the, AO, the AOV went up. And so the economics, I think, were able to work a lot better um, with Meta. But, yeah, we do a lot with Meta. Um, or back then we did. And we still do. Uh, we did a lot with influencers. Um, we started posting and doing work with TikTok influencers in 2019. So that was well before, like, you know, everyone started adopting TikTok. Uh, and I remember when we launched at Target, we did a, a kind of split campaign between Instagram and TikTok. Uh, and the TikTok campaign performed actually way better than the uh, Instagram campaign because the TikTok influencers back then, back then were so cheap. Like someone with a million followers back then, this is 2019, uh, I think we paid them like $100 for, for like a post or two. I don't think you can get those prices anymore, uh, but uh, we definitely saw the results and um, really doubled down on TikTok pretty early. Very cool. I bet your conversion rates, even with $15 AOV in the beginning, I bet your conversion rates were pretty high though, just for a product that is marketed as well. Or was it was it, was it a real challenge like out, out the gate? They were, no, I think the conversion rate was not bad. I mean, as with anything, it could have been better, but I think it was, yeah, off the bat, like not, not too bad. I don't and know then, that it was like amazing, but yeah. And then as you add more SKUs, it's it's sort of the bundling strategy that gets your mm -hmm. AOV up yes. essentially or just people filling their carts more. Well, so yeah, as we introduced new SKUs, we talk a lot about how they work together. So we talk um, a lot about how we make products for the entire life cycle of a pimple because you use a patch when you have a pimple. And then we have all these products for after the pimple, like you have the dark spot or you, we have uh, rescue balm, which helps with the, um, the redness and the dryness. And, um, and so that really helps, um, that helps introduce other products to their routine or regimen. And then it helps increase the OB. Very cool. What about uh, Google? Are you guys, uh, you're probably a pretty active brand owning the brand and expanding on Google? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember, you know what, one of the first things that I did when we had our website was uh, I started writing blogs for SEO. And so one of the first articles that I wrote was, what is hydrocolloid and what does it do? Uh, and I remember for a long while, like that article, like whenever you, yeah, you would type in like hydrocolloid acne patches, that was the top, one of the top uh, articles um, that came up in Google search results. I don't know if I haven't searched it recently, so I don't know if it still does. But um, yeah, sort of invested, I think, the time in SEO and blog writing. We hired um, blog writers uh, to basically pump out like three to five articles a week. Um, and so the SEO strategy, I think, was yeah, important for us. And then on top what, of that, what, we, you know, we do the traditional like, yeah, SEM and, and all that too. Google shopping and whatnot. Yeah. These days it's expensive to get shoppers to your store. So when they do show up, you want to make the most of each order. Thankfully there's after sale post purchase upsell, the most popular upsell app on Shopify with after sale. You can create targeted on brand post purchase offers that maximize your AOV. Trusted by over 6,000 merchants, including hundreds of Shopify Plus stores like Brewmate, True Classic Tees, and Good American, AfterSell has generated over $50 million in revenue for their merchants. 
we've partnered with Aftersell to create a special offer for DTC listeners. Visit aftersell.com slash DTC for a 10% off lifetime subscription to Aftersell and white glove support for plus merchants. On top of that, there's a 30-day free trial, so there's zero risk to installing. That's aftersell.com slash DTC. One of the choices it seems like you made, I think I read it in one of your tweets, is to not sort of put yourself put yourself in front of the brand in a way. A lot of founders, I was just uh, talking with founders, loved, you know, founder stories are so critical and, and a lot of founders do really put themselves out there as the face of the brand, whether it's making TikToks or things like that. It seems like a, a bit of a conscious choice, like not to that. I feel like you're, you're stepping out a bit now and following your Twitter, like you're emerging as a thought leader sort of more these days, but I feel like you, you didn't put yourself f- first and foremost on the brand. Was that a conscious choice? So I, I have a personal philosophy on this. Um, I mean, I do think the founder story is important because it gives the brand more like soul and a history. And I think people can relate to it. Like for me, when I go to a new brand site that I don't, um, that I'm not familiar with, one of the first things that I do is I go to the About Us uh, page. Because I want to know, like, how is this created? Who came up with the idea? Like, I, like it's really interesting to me. Uh, but I, I, like, my personal philosophy is that when you are the brand, um, it it actually increases the risk, I think, for the actual like products and the brand that you are marketing. Because I remember someone, um, was, you know, someone was like, uh, this, so there's this brand called Sunbum, and um, they created a, what they did was they created a mascot, uh, and it's this big gorilla named Sunny or this big monkey named Sunny. And so I remember the founder was telling me like, I did that because Sunny can never get a DUI and get in trouble and then get canceled, you know. And so in, especially in like the, um, the age that we're in, I think we've seen kind of like the, the risk and the downside of it. But I mean, I think it's fine because you do need to advocate for your brand and really tell the story and share the story. I think for me, it becomes a question of, um, you know, do you become the brand? Uh, and I think we've seen some cases where the founder does become the brand um, which I think increases, yeah, the risk. And, and then also for me, like when I see brands so intertwined with one person, I just question like the longevity of that brand, because what happens if that person goes away for some reason? Um, like does the business suffer? Um, and so I don't know, I just prefer to, yeah, help share the story and tell the story, but like, I just don't want to be the, you know, I don't want to be the brand. And, you know, reading your, your tweets, like, I don't, I don't know how much of this was intentional, but there's so many decisions it feels like you made about how you built this business that made it an attractive both investment and eventually acquisition target. And I feel like that's just another thing. Like with, with, uh, with my brand, you know, if I, ever, if I ever sell D2C, I'm the podcast guy. I'm still going to keep doing podcasts potentially. But, like, but, but not putting yourself as the face of the brand probably makes it like less easier to, to uh, exit potentially as well, right? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, because again, like, like I remember I was talking to an influencer and she has her own brand. And I remember she was telling me that like, oh, I have to, I have to keep posting about the brand because every time I post, um, our CAC actually lowers because there's, you know, I have my own sort of audience, built-in audience. And so, um, you know, my investors keep telling me to keep posting and to keep talking about the brand which is fine. It's kind of, I guess, an arbitrage opportunity. But the problem that I see with that is the minute this person steps away because they sell the company, like that the CAC is going to go up. So it's an artificially lowered CAC um, that you get for a period of time when that person is with you. But, um, but again, I think, you know, once you exit to a company, you're not going to be the face of the brand forever. And and the economics probably change. So, um, so anyways, yeah, I think, I mean, I think it can be well done for sure. And I think there's a lot of benefit to having a founder talk about the brand and the brand story. Um, it's just, I always like get nervous when I think the brand founder becomes a brand and then sort of like reality divorces from, I think, you know, what everyone thought. Um, and, you know, sometimes like, a lot of founders give the appearance of having these crazy, amazing brands and companies, 
And then when you when you dig into the actual facts, like the businesses actually aren't that compelling. And so it's, you know, that's an example of where I think image and reality get divorced and then just, I don't know, bad things can happen. Interesting. Um, so uh, doing some research here over the years, you, you took some funding, 16.2 million over three funding rounds. I'm, you know, a business that is has been bootstrapped, uh, has been profitable from sounds like from day one or from close to it. Um, can you talk a little bit about your decision to take funds? Like what, what did you first decide you needed to take funds for or you wanted to take funds for? Um, so, yes, you're, we were profitable since the very beginning. Since year one, we were profitable. We didn't need the money. Um, but we wanted to raise for like basically thought partners because we knew we wanted to exit this company at some point, but none of us had ever sold companies. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we were buttoned up and doing everything right. So we wanted people who were kind of like our business coaches, um, helping us along the way with certain strategic decisions or, uh, and our investors actually were really amazing in the exit process itself because they knew like which bankers to contact, which lawyers to work with, how to, you know, how to craft a compelling story even like the economic points, which like a lot of them flew over my head, like they were able to negotiate and get better economics for um, for everybody. So yeah, there was a lot of benefit there. Um, really just having, you know, I mean, what I would call sort of business coaches helping you optimize everything um, for for a really great outcome. One of, the, one of the things I see our friend Sean tweeting about is, um, D to C 1.0 companies that are struggling now that took, took a lot of money that maybe they exited and they're struggling now. Maybe they haven't exited. They're, they're looking for an exit. I feel like your story is a bit of a, it's the hero of the space in a lot of ways right now with this idea. And I'm sure you're like, there's a lot of stories of D to C investors, not getting the multiples that they're looking for, I think, for a lot of brands in this in the first couple waves of D2C. So first of all, congrats on your exit and uh, having such a, a sm smashing result there. Um, what, can you just talk a little bit about that process and, and, and what that was like actually exiting the business? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of work. Um, it was really stressful and it was a lot of work. Um, it is not easy exiting a company and selling a company. So uh, I mean, it really starts with like deciding that you want to go out. And so for us, we like I get asked um, by other founders, like, how did you know this was the, the time to go? Like, how did you know it was now? And um, for us, we always had like the hundred million dollar revenue mark as a kind of internal hurdle. Like we always said, OK, once we get to hundred million dollars, we're going to go out. So we hit that. And then and then we started having the conversations. But uh, not just that, I think we quickly saw our category getting really, really competitive. Like, you know, we talked earlier about like, you know, how we're a category creator. And I mean, Johnson & Johnson just launched two patches under Band-Aid and Neutrogena and Viore has a patch. And like, I mean, people are coming after us. And so I think that was an um, another dynamic where we wanted to really um, dig in our heels and sort of defend ourselves. And it would have been, you know, it would be better with, um, um, bigger guns. So those were like two big factors. And um, so it starts with hiring a banker. Um, we hired Fininka Raymond James. Um, you hire the banker. There's a lot of prep work that happens because you have to like kind of download your whole story and business to them so they can best present your, your company to potential buyers. Um, you know, you do like various um, uh, market research studies and things like that to kind of validate the story. Then you, you start like meeting people kind of for private um, invite only meetings. So they'll select like a few, you know, key potential acquirers for um, an early look at the company. Um, this is all pre NDA. And then, um, and then you sign the NDA and then you go out with like your management presentation or not your manager, your, 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 um, book of materials. Um, and then from, from there, uh, I think there are like fireside chats and then there was like a first offer. So basically at that time, um, everyone's sort of bidding off of the book that they saw. Um, maybe they've had like one or two conversations with you. Um, so they put in initial offers just to, sh you know, show that they're interested. Um, and then, you know, if it's a lot of people, then it gets whittled down. 
and uh, and then you do more due diligence work, which you know you end up usually narrowing the field even more. Um, and then you know you get down to like a few parties, and then you get into negotiation, and then you know you decide to sign the deal with the right person. So it's a little bit about the process. It took us about a year. Yep. The and then you pop the champagne. I popped a lot of champagne. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. That's so cool. And then I don't know if you can talk about it, but now, but you're still leading the company and I don't, is there, do you, can you speak of whether you have an exit plan to leave, whether you're staying, what's it also like staying at a company that you have exited still leading it? Yeah, I am sticking around. So, um, you know, Hero's only been around for five years, so I think for um, for everybody is really important the founders stay for continuity. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of institutional knowledge that we have that that we need to share. Um, also for a team, because you know, I think it's important that uh, like we've hired so many great people over the years that we want and we want all of them to stay. So, you know, like it's not a really great, it's not a good signal. I think when the three founders leave immediately, um, and so we want everyone to stay. So we're staying, and um, yeah, I mean, we're just we're figuring it out. Like I think every acquisition is different. Uh, there's no like set playbook. So right now we're in a period of getting to know each other um, uh, in a deeper way, um, really getting to know like what the capabilities that Trish and White has. Uh, they're getting to know and getting up to speed on all our plans and our capabilities. Um, so I, th- I think it's going to be like that for a good bit. Very cool. What what are, are, are what are some ways that your life has changed since the exit, since the big win? Is there anything that you've that you've changed? You know, it's funny because um, mostly guys ask me this. So they'll be like, oh, like, how did it feel when all that money went into your account? And like, I mean, of course, it's like you celebrate. And sometimes I laugh when I look at my bank account. But um, <laughs> but like I tell people that like, you know, my life is no is not very different. Like I still, li- you know, I have the same clothes. I still live in the same apartment. I have the same lifestyle. Like, you know, I, I think. I think sometimes people think like the minute the money gets into your account, you're going to like overnight, I don't know, be different, but it's not really like that. And I don't think money should really change you. I mean, I would hope it doesn't really change people. Um, So yeah, I'd say like, um, you know, post exit, nothing's really different. I have more time on my hands because I'm not so tied up in the M&A transaction. Um, uh, I'm starting to think about like, yeah, how I want to give back, how I want to, how, you know, now that I have more time, how I want to, how I want to use my time, how I'm going to give back to the like founder and entrepreneur, um, community. So those are things that I'm still, I don't have answers to, but it's what I'm thinking about. I love it. And you know, we're, we're two years in on, on this business and it's, um, it's been pretty successful so far. It's been great, but I feel like I've been in the in the shit so much when it comes to just like growing it and hustling. It's like I haven't like, you know, there is some success, but I haven't really allowed myself to feel it. I was just talking with a, a, a founder who has a business that's like roughly the same size as mine. And she was talking about how she's, she's traveling, she's doing, you know, she's going to all these executive functions and, and she's sort of like, she's, she's evolved herself to the point where she's doing um, different, a different kind of thing that I feel like I've allowed myself to do in the stage of business that I'm at right now. So I imagine even in your business, like a lot of the changes may have been through those through the five years that you were achieving massive success potentially like maybe there maybe there were more changes like during that period than even just during this like you know symbolic event of having a a laughable bank account (laughs) yeah yeah probably i mean um you're right it's sort of like every time like you have step step ups i think in your business and then you as a person or as a leader, you have to, you have to step up also, you have to evolve. Um, uh, and so you're right. It probably has been more of a, um, a change like over time rather than something that happens overnight. Um, so yeah, I would agree with that. Do you, what do you see in your future? Like, I, I, are you, do you, like the rush of building a company to a hundred million, like just that, that, that sheer growth must've been quite, uh, quite addictive in a way. What, where do you see your future? Do you see yourself, ri- you know, riding this, getting this as big as it can? Cause it could still be much bigger. Um, do you, do you have that hunger to start from zero again? Um, so, I mean, there's still so much opportunity. Like we have a lot of retail partners that we're not in yet. Uh, we're not in international, 
Uh, we still have a ton of like product ideas. So there's, yeah, I still get excited about like the wins at Hero because there's still a ton of growth, I think, ahead of us. But at the same time, sometimes I do get that itch of like, oh, you know, what's going to be my next idea? And I, I do like the earlier stages where um, uh, I think sometimes the wins are sweeter because you're up against so many, you know, other challenges. Um, but I was having lunch with someone and he was like, but do you really want to, you know, want to like get back to zero? And I was like, yeah, it's kind of a good question because do I really want to, you know, go to the post office every single day, mailing out influencer samples? Like, do I, you know, do I want to email 50 PR people every single day? But I mean, I'm sure next time, like maybe I myself won't be doing those things. Cause I think from a resource standpoint, I'll have resources to have a bigger team. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe one day I'll, I'll, be, I'll get back on the saddle and start something different. I don't have an idea yet, but, um, but it's still, yeah, appealing. What about angel investing or, because I feel like that is something where you could, you're obviously you've, you've, your story is, could be the new playbook in some ways, right? I'm sure there's lots of people that'd be interested in your expertise, even aside from your funds. Yeah. Yeah, uh, um, I do angel invest. Um, I don't think I'm going to be an investor. I, I know there are a lot of founders that um, create their own funds and they go to the investing side. I don't think I have the muscle for that, but I love being an angel investor just to be able to support um, other founders and entrepreneurs out there. Um, I think one thing that I, I do want to work on is really figuring out what my like thesis is or like the key, you know, having a framework through which I evaluate everything because um, now like a lot of things come across my desk. And so I, I want a better filter um, so I can really pick and choose the things that I think are interesting or um, the things that I really care about, like, you know, backing sort of underrepresented founders, for example. Um, so I, I do, I want to work on kind of building a tighter framework, I think. I think you've nailed it. I think you want bootstrap companies with high gross margins, with strong repurchase, with a lean, efficient team, and strong growth. <laughs> yeah. Easy, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Just check I, that uh, list off, and you're great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although not every company can be like that. So, but the ones that are, I yeah, that was a thumb stop page for sure. That's awesome. Um, so heading into Q4, I don't know if you. You know, do you have any commentary? Like, I just feel like we're all kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop in the economy right now. I'm hearing all the time that, you know, batten down the hatches. It's going to, you know, there's, it's going to get worse before it gets better. How, how are you viewing the economy and your category? It's, it's, it's something, it's consumable. I, it's something that people are not going to like give up on necessarily. People are always going to want to get rid of their pimples. How do you view the economic factors and your business? Um, I view... Okay, so I think beauty, there's still a lot of tailwinds with beauty in general because it is that sort of affordable luxury. You know, and I think it was Leonard Lauder who coined the phrase, the lipstick effect. Um, so in recessions, beauty tends to do really well and be very resilient. Um, I think there could be some trading down from more premium brands to, because we're priced more kind of like mastige, like we're not as cheap as a, I don't know, clear cell, but we're not as expensive as a La Roche-Posay, for example. So we're kind of in that middle. So I think we'll be okay because I think we'll, we'll benefit maybe if there is trading down, like we'll probably benefit um, from some of that downflow. And then um, will we lose some people to some cheaper brands? Maybe, but, but I think what we have going for us is that people see our products as a a need to have, not a nice to have. Like it really is a necessity because when you have that pimple, like you really want it to go away and people will spend a lot of money, even in a recession, I think, um, to, to buy the products they need to have clear skin. So I think we're going to be pretty durable during um, any sort of, you know, economic headwinds. Um, and I think we're in the right category. We have the right price point. And um, yeah, I think that problem solution angle is it, it um, will keep us uh, strong. Very cool. What? Okay, so this is like one of my canned questions. Uh, and I'll bump it up. It's usually 50,000. But for the scale of here, I got to do at least 100,000. So we're, we're going to grant you $100,000 to be used in your it's got to be used kind of in your marketing in let's say Q4. Uh, for for incremental growth, where would you top of mind be putting a hundred thousand dollars to see the most growth with Hero? 
I mean, we, honestly, we probably put it um, towards Amazon because that's the channel where we see the highest ROAS. Um, every time we put more money into it, like we tend to see really great returns and there's still a lot that we like can do and want to do on that channel. Um, if not there, I'd probably, we work with this amazing agency um, for influencers they're called Influencer Res Response. I'd probably give them an extra 100K to find us a really um, amazing influencer that we haven't partnered with that yet because the amazing thing about them is that they work with um, creators and influencers that actually convert and they track all the results uh, really on an ROI basis. So, um, so we've worked with some really amazing influencers where we give them $50,000, they return like, I don't know, 75 or 80. Um, so I think that would be, be my number two. That's excellent. Um, and when you say Amazon, you're referring to Amazon ads a lot, uh, yeah. actually yes. boosting. Yeah. Amazon ads, yeah. getting like your listing up. Yeah. Sponsored products. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then on the, so I was reading recently about sort of the sea change that's happened in the past few years with influencers too, whereas previously you were looking for the biggest name people, you know, who had the biggest reach, the Kardashians and so on. But your focus on, it sounds a lot less about their individual reach and more on their capacity to tell great stories and be great creators. Is that accurate? Or is it also a real balance of their individual reach and their sort of creative style? Uh, I think it's both. And I, I think it's creators that really, like, because they tell amazing stories and they know to ha how to create the content, they have really amazing engagement uh, and they have people that um, have high willingness to purchase. So it's sort of all, I think, intertwined. But yeah, those are the people that we like to work with, whether they're like huge or whether they're, you know, kind of small on the smaller side. And then do you reuse that content in your own ads via whitelisting or dark posting or just reposting it, creator content on your own feed? We, we've, um, we've dabbled with whitelisting. I don't know. I know we saw some early, um, early potential with it, but I don't know that we've been able to get it, get it to work at scale. Um, I know we've, we've done like a few one-offs that worked really well and we saw a lot of yeah potential, but, um, but I don't think we were at that point where we're like, you know, doubling down and, and really um, hitting it hard yet. Very cool. Any, uh, any, Q, any big Q4 plans or anything like in your pipeline for Black Friday, Cyber Monday? Is that, is that a big holiday in beauty or is that a big, a big yeah. sales event oh, in beauty like it is everywhere else? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Yeah. So um, we're not on promotion very much at all, but Black Friday, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, that is the one time, one of the few times that we'll be having um, a sale on our website. Um, we're also uh, maybe launching a new product in December. So that's going to be really exciting. Um, uh, and I think people are really going to like it. Nice. Ju, thank you so much for coming on the D2C podcast. I know you're active on Twitter. Would, can we share your handle at Ju, at Ju Rayu? Yep. Yeah. Nice. Um, and if you want to know more about Hero Cosmetics, you can go to Hero Cosmetics. Sorry, it's heroescosmetics.com? Yep. Nice. Very cool. Well, thanks again. This is uh, a lot of fun. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. I look forward me. to kind of following your journey. Um, as you get more comfortable with balling out with your hilarious bank account. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I will awesome. be sure to uh, share more about my post-exit life. <laughs>Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can do that right now at direct to consumer all one word, dot co. I'm Eric Dick, and this has been the D2C Podcast. We'll see you next time.